praise the Lord and uh, welcome to uh, our presentation in this series, The Prophets. And um, in number four, we are going to look at uh, the greater light versus uh, the lesser light. And so I want us to pray and then we shall be able to continue with our presentation. Our loving Father in heaven, again, it is just joyous to approach the throne of grace and be able to learn. And so help us as we continue in this series, the Lord, we shall present truth in a truthful way. And above all, Lord, that uh, we shall not look at uh, humans, but we shall continue looking unto thee for guidance in all things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so we are looking into the series, The Prophets. And uh, how I pray that um, this will continue to be a blessing unto us. As we continue exploring uh, the various aspects of the message that we have. And uh, at this moment, I just want to look at uh, the... Uh, the greater light that is the greater light versus um, the lesser light these are times that uh, are mostly known in adventism but uh, it is something that is in the bible and uh, where else can we start but in the book of john chapter one that uh, <clears throat> Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. And look at what it says in verse 8. He was not the light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighted every man that cometh into the well, and so we find that uh, John came to witness uh, of the light and he was not uh, the light. And Jesus Christ was the light. And how do we know that Jesus Christ actually was the light? In uh, John, John chapter 8 verses 12. We read, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, we are told that John was not the light, but Christ himself is the light. So, um, we are seeing light. But again, when we read in the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 Matthew chapter 5 we are told ye are the light of the world a city that is set on a hill can not be hid, hid and so are we having true two lights in the world that is um, we as the disciples of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ himself no what we are having is the great source of all. I mean, uh, Jesus Christ, who is the source of the light. And uh, we understand from uh, other writings that there is the great source of all who is the Father. But Jesus Christ is the light. Even God as he is light because everything the Father has, the Son has. And then we as the disciples of Jesus Christ, we reflect the same because we are called Christians. That is Christ-like. And so if Christ is the light, then all of his disciples are the reflectors of the same light. And so exploring this issue of um, the lesser light versus the greater light. Uh, in Kolpotua Evangelists, <clears throat> page 37, the greater and lesser lights, little heed is given to the Bible 
and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. And so somebody will say, then from there, the greater light is the Bible. But what is the Bible actually? The Bible is a collection of books inspired by the Spirit of God. In one word, we can say that the Bible is the Word of God. Now, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so Christ is the Word of God. Even as we saw in the previous presentation, that actually Christ is the presence of God. He is the very Spirit of God in character and in nature. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Being the Son of God, He is the revelation of the thoughts of God. And so the Bible uh, is uh, um, a collection of books that speaks about the life of Jesus Christ. And so the Bible is the greater light being the embodiment of Jesus Christ, then Jesus Christ is the greater light in this context if we believe that um, he is the word, the thought made audible, the thought expressed by the Father. And so going back to this, we see that um, um, little heed is given to the Bible and the Lord has given a greater, has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. The call for two evangelists, page 37 in 1902. The Lord has sent his people much instruction, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here little and here a little. Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. Oh, how much good will be accomplished if the books containing this light were read with a determination to carry out the principles they contain. There will be a thousandfold greater vigilance and thousandfold more self-denial and resolute effort and many more will now be rejoicing in the light of the present truth with that thought that um, jesus christ is the bible jesus christ is the greater light uh look at what christ himself says in the book of john uh in the book of john he says in john chapter 5 verse 39 Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are the testify of me. So the word of God, the Bible, is the greater light. But those scriptures, they are the ones that testify of Jesus Christ. And so Christ, in other words, is the greater light, even as the Bible is uh, uh, the uh, greater uh, light. And then Jesus Christ says that he is the bread of life. He is that word that uh, people may feed on and have everlasting life. As we search the scriptures and feed on this eternal truth, we are taking the blood and the flesh of Jesus Christ, which is his word. And so the, you can separate the word and Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, technically, uh, I can say uh, that in the scriptures are they that testify of uh, him. How do we understand then the above quotes? The lesser light and the greater light explained. For one reason or another, there are many who believe that the writings of E.G. White are lesser light as compared with the Bible, which is said to be the greater light. And so let us explore this. Um, let us take a look at number of passages in Sister White's writing and in the Bible and see if the terms lesser light and greater light are clearly then defined because uh, she will be the uh, uh, Sister White will be the one that will unlock Sister White and the scripture will the one will be the ones that unlock uh, the scripture. Now, John was more than a prophet. While prophets had seen from afar Christ's advent, to John it was given to behold him and to present him to Israel at the send of God. The prophet John was the lesser light. Now, this thought, where does she derive it from? Let us just finish. The prophet John was the lesser light to be followed by a greater. No other light ever will shine so clearly on fallen men as the teaching and example of Jesus Christ. Now, 
he says that John was the lesser light. And we read in the book of John that John came to testify of the light. That is Jesus Christ. To exemplify that which the scripture had revealed in the, prophet, in the prophecies that will come as the Messiah. And so he was not the light. So he was a lesser light to point to the greater light, which was Jesus Christ himself. You cannot say that the reflectors of the light are the light themselves. Yet they are the light in the sense that whatsoever thing that they shall reflect, it is from the giver of that light. The prophet John was the connecting link between the two dispensations. As God's representative, he stood forth to show the relation of the law and the prophet to the Christian dispensation. He was the lesser light which was to be followed by a greater. The mind of John was illuminated by the Holy Spirit that he might shed light upon his people, but no other light ever has shone or ever will shine so clearly upon the fallen man as that which emanated from the teaching and example of Jesus. Christ and his mission had been built dimly understood Christ and his mission had been but dimly understood as typified in the shadow sacrifice. Says, even John had not fully comprehended the future immortal life through the Savior. That is, um, first of all, we read from the book Heaven, uh, Healthful Living, page 145, paragraph 5, and then Desire of Ages, 220, paragraph 2. Now, uh, uh, in TDG, uh, this day with God, uh, I presume that is um, the book in uh, TDG. This day with God, this is uh, what we read. With the first advent of Christ, there was ushered in an era of greater light and glory. But it will be indeed, but it will indeed be sinful ingratitude to despise and ridicule the lesser light because a fuller and more glorious light had dawned. Those who despise the blessings and glory of the Jewish age are not prepared to be benefited by the preaching of the gospel. The brightness of the Father's glory and the excellence of the perfection of his sacred law are only understood through the atonement made upon Calvary by his dear son, but even the atonement loses its significance when the law of God is rejected. And so, with the advent of Christ, there was ushered in an era of greater light. But um, uh, it will indeed be sinful uh, ingratitude to despise and ridicule the lesser light because of a fuller and more glorious uh, light had dawned. Those who despise the blessing of the glory of the Jewish age are not prepared to be benefited of the preaching of the gospel. Now you see how the lesser and the greater light are used in this passage. In that um, the Jewish dispensation and it is shadowy types is termed here as a lesser light. And then the dispensation of the gospel, that is some um, uh, that compacted prophecy of the Jewish uh, system unveiled is called the greater light. You can see the usage between the greater light and the lesser light. In that, if I'm understanding um, according to my capacity, the lesser light is that which does not reveal fully something. But uh, the greater that the lesser light is that which does not reveal in fullness the thing that it talks about. But um, the greater light is the fullness of the unveiling of that which was not explained fully. That is how I understand the quote to be speaking uh, about and so um, again the religion of the Jewish in, in consequence of their departure from God consisted mostly in ceremony. John was the lesser light which was to be followed by a greater light. He was to shake the confidence of the people in their traditions and call their sins to their remembrance and lead them to repentance that they might be prepared to appreciate the work of Christ. God communicated to John by inspiration, illuminating the prophet that he might remove the superstition and darkness from the minds of the honest Jewish, which had been through false teaching for generation gathering upon them. Review and Herald, April 8, 
1873. And so, in other words, God's servants, of which John the Baptist was the primary example, are lesser light, and God's son is the greater light. The type and the shadows are the lesser light. The full revel revelation of the gospel is the greater light. Now, let us see if this definition corresponds with um, the biblical definition of the same time terms. In John 1, 6 to 9, which uh, we read is that there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men should through him might believe. He was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighted every man that cometh into the world. Who, not what, is the lesser light. And so, if we combine what we have learned from the previous passages from Sister Wise's writing with the record of the Apostle John, we will notice that we read the passage from the links uh, that Sister White herself is being referred to a lesser light pointing to the Jesus Christ, the greater light. And so all the prophets, all the messengers of God, all the disciples of Jesus Christ are lesser light which points to the greater light which is Jesus Christ herself. And I can avail the document so that you may go through the references. Sister White didn't call her writings a lesser light. She called gold servants, including herself, a lesser light. And so, an uh, inspiration of uh, the Holy Spirit. God's servant, E.G. White, was inspired by the same Holy Spirit and in the same manner of all the writers of the Holy Scriptures. And what she was inspired to write was the same purpose as the Holy Scriptures. Because we read in, in, in the Bible, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, all scriptures given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. And so, uh, in uh, Selected Messages, Book 1, page 45, Paragraph 1, when you find men questioning the testimonies, finding fault with them and seeking to draw away the people from their influence be assured that God is not at work through them. It is another spirit. Doubt and unbelief are cherished by those who do not walk circumspectly. They have a painful consciousness that their life will not abide the taste of the spirit of God, whether speaking through his word or through the testimonies of his spirit that will bring them to his word. Again, the Holy Ghost is the author of scriptures and of the spirit of prophecy. Uh, that is uh, in 3SM 30.3. Again, the power of God will come upon me and I was enabled clearly to define what is truth and what is error. So she says, and we shall be looking in the, into this uh, in the coming presentation. And so as the points of our faith were established, our feet were placed upon a solid foundation. We accepted the truth point by point under the demonstration of uh, the Holy Spirit. Again, uh, uh, we can safely conclude that all the gifts of the Spirit of God are given to his servants. And um, the people themselves, they are the lesser light in this sense, that these are human beings who, when they are not under a divine influence, can err. And so they are like a light shining in a dark place to give guidance to the children of God because we are told that uh, we have a more sh uh, sure word of prophecy. So take heed of it because it's like a light shining in dark place until the day dawn. And so all the prophet, the personage of the prophet is the lesser light, but the message he carries when it is of the divine origin it cannot be termed as lesser light, but it is the light itself, which God has seen it good to give unto his church. And so the human beings themselves, they are the lesser light, but the, uh, 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 the messages given, because they are messages of reproof, they are messages of correction, and uh, they are messages to thoroughly furnish the children of God unto truth, they are not lesser light, but they are greater light because it is the spirit of Christ speaking through a vessel and not uh, 
а, 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 да, 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 да. The will of men who are speaking. And so, a question has always arose that uh, then how do we deal with, um, how shall we approach the Bible questions uh, and answering the critics and even the gift, dealing with the gift of uh, non-canonical inspired messengers of God. And so let herself who uh, was believed to be a messenger of God, uh, let us hear from her what she would have to say about this matter. How do we relate to Bible question, answering critics, and dealing with the writings of non-canonical messengers of God whom he has sent to admonish the church. And uh, so here we have her uh, instructing the church on the route that they may take. And uh, I'll be doing a lot of reading here. But God will have a peep upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. The opinion of learned men, the deductions of some, the creeds, or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, not one, not nor all of this should be regarded as evident for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plan that saith the Lord in its support. So, we are not to refuse or to reject the writings or uh, the messages of these people, but we should take them and bring them to the litmus check of the Bible and see whether the things they speak, they are of God, or they are not of God. We are told we are not to reject them. All this should be regarded, they should not be, not one or all of this should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious. Let everyone be tested by the Bible. May God help you all and help me. I want help and strength and power, but do not quote Sister White till you stand on vantage ground where you know what you are doing. Take the word of God. It is full of meat and drink. Study the Bible and you will know more of God than you do now. You will have something fresh to impart to others. You will not go over the same ground again and again. You will realize that there is a world to save. I ask you to put on the whole armor and be sure that your, your feet are showed with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So she asked the people, don't quote me, don't take my word. You have the Bible, you travel with it and see the rich things that you can actually get from uh, the Bible. And then you can check with the others who are saying that they are servants of the Lord and see if they are the servants of the Lord or they are not the servants of uh, the Lord. And so we have the Bibles with us and we can get all the truth from them. We should never quote a non-canonical writer until we have a vantage ground on what the Bible says on every doctrine that we have. And true prophets will lead the people to the Bible and not unto themselves and their writing. Again, how can the Lord bless those who manifest a spirit of I don't care, a spirit which leads them to walk contrary to the light which the Lord has given them? But I do not ask you to take my words, lay Sister White to one side. Do not quote my words again as long as you live until you can obey the Bible. Ellen White was meeting the leaders of the church as a group for the first time in 10 years. Situations in both the General Conference and in our Battle Creek based institution had in many cases reached a low wave. Testimonies calling for a return to Bible principles had been received. Theoretical, but no real improvement had taken place. And so she, she tells the people, don't quote me, go back to your Bibles and know that you are following the Bible and then you can come back and quote me. Because when you know what is in the Bible, then you will be able to counter check what you are reading from non-canonical prophets, if it is the truth. 
In 3SM 29.3, in public labor, do not make prominent and quote that which Sister White has written as authority to sustain your point, positions. To do this will not increase faith in the testimonies. Bring your evidence as clear and plain from the word of God. As thou said, the Lord is the strongest testimony you can possibly represent, present to the people. Let none be educated to look to Sister White, but to the mighty God who gives instruction to Sister White. But there is in the word, the precious word. This is Spalding and Magan, page 167. But here is the word, the precious word exalted before you today. And don't you give a rap anymore that Sister White said, Sister White said this, and Sister White said that, and Sister White said the other thing. But say, thus said the Lord of God of Israel. And then you do just what the Lord God of Israel does and what he says. But don't you quote Sister White. I don't want you ever to quote Sister White until you get your vantage ground where you know where you are. Quote the Bible, SPM 174. Talk the Bible. It is full of meat, full of fatness. Carry it right out in your life and you will know more Bible than you know now. You will have fresh or you will have precious matter. You won't be doing over and over again the same ground. And you will see a world saved. You will see souls of whom Christ has died. And I ask you to put on the armor every piece of it and be sure that your feet are showed with the preparation of the gospel. Again, she says, now he is the way the matter is represented. But when there is, I do not care and going right contrary to the light God has given in his word, I do not ask you to take my word. I do not ask you to do it. Lay Sister White right to one side. You lay her right to one side. Do you not? Never quote my words again as long as you live until you can obey the Bible. When you take the Bible and make that, make that your food, your meat, and your drink, and make that the elements of your character, when you can do that, then you will know better how to receive some counsel from God. But here is the word, the precious word. I exalt it before you today and do not go and repeat anymore what Sister White said. Sister White said this and Sister White said that. And Sister White said the one thing. You say what said the Lord God of Israel. And then you do just what the Lord God of Israel does and what he says. Christ says, I do the works of my father, the works that I see him do. I do 1 John 5, 19 in uh, manuscript 43, D, 1901. But uh, let me bring you to one important thing. Just in conjunction with what she is saying that you do not quote her, but you quote the Bible. What does Jesus Christ himself say in the book of John? And uh, the book of John chapter 7. The book of John, chapter 7, verse 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true and no unrighteousness in, is in him. And so Jesus Christ is saying, as Sister White say, if you follow the Bible, you shall know if the doctrine is true or not. If you follow after Jesus Christ, you will know if what you are going to read in this extra canonical materials is true or it is false. And it's in this revelation that the Bible gives us that we shall know that which is the truth and that which is false. Continuing to see what Sister White had to say about the Bible in Council to Writers and Editors, at page 33, paragraph 3. Here now was a question that was asked. A brother asked, Sister White, do you think we must understand the truth for ourselves? Why can we not take the truth that others have gathered together and believe them because they have investigated the subject, and then we shall be free to go on without the taxing of the powers of the mind in the investigations of all these subjects. 
Do you not think that these men who have brought out the truth in the past were inspired of God? And uh, what is this person trying to speak to Sister White? That uh, we have people who have been believed to have been inspired by God. And they are non-canonical writers. But people have read their materials and felt that the spirit of God was leading these people. And so one of the brothers was inquiring, can we just take this and then believe in it as the truth? But then let us listen to what she had to say. And take heed to what she's going to say. I dare not say they were not led by God, continuing for, uh, page 34, paragraph 1, cancel to writers and editors. I dare not say they were not led of God, for Christ leads into all truth. But when it comes to inspiration in the fullest sense of the word, I answer no. I believe that God has given them a work to do, but if they are not fully consecrated to God at all times, they will weave self and their peculiar traits of character in what they are doing, and will put their mold upon the work and fashion men in religious experience after their own pattern. It is dangerous for us to make flesh our arm. We should lean upon the arm of infinite power. God has been revealing this to us for years. We must have living faith in our hearts and reach out for larger knowledge, more advanced light. And so if um, our beliefs, if our defense will be based upon what men have written and spoken, then we shall be leaning on the arm of flesh. And that is when you will find that people go into another extreme in that they will want to speak like so and so. They will like to have the clothes of so and so. And they like to have the equipment of so and so because they go to this fanatical extreme that whatsoever so and so did because he was under inspiration, then I can do it and I'll not be in error. And so you find that people are going into extremes with this word inspiration. Just because they think somebody was inspired, they go even to the length of speaking like those people, copying the walking patterns of those people, copying even the clothing of those people because they, they have elevated the person to a position of God in that the person is now revered and everything that he was is that which everyone should be. And that is why we are told in the book of Jeremiah, the book of um, Jeremiah, this is what we read. Jeremiah 17, 5, Thus said the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from God. And so you find that if you lean on the arm of flesh, the end of the journey is a departure from God, because you will be looking to men instead of looking unto God. Continued on. Uh, She says in Council to Writers and Editors, page 34, paragraph 2, there is um, a spirit of Phariseeism has been coming in upon our people who claim to believe the truth for this last day. They are self-satisfied. They have said we have the truth. And this is the condition with Laodicea and Chuck. There is no more light for the people of God, but we are not safe when we take a position that we will not accept anything else than that upon which we have settled as truth. We should take the Bible and investigate it closely for ourselves. We should dig in the mind of God's word for truth. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Some um, have asked me if I thought there was any more light for the people of God. Our minds have become so narrow that we do not seem to understand that the Lord has a mighty work to do for us. Increasing light is to shine upon us, for the path of the just is of the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect uh, day. And this is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. And page 35, paragraph 1, new light will ever be revealed on the word of God to him who is in living connection with the Son of Righteousness. Let no one come to the conclusion that there is no more truth to be revealed. 
The diligent, prayerful seeker for truth will find precious rays of light yet to shine forth from the word of God. Many gems are yet scattered that are to be gathered together to become the property of the remnant people of God. And so there is no excuse for anyone in taking the posi position that there is no more truth to be revealed and that all our exposition of the scripture are without error. So even with her amidst them, she is saying there is no excuse in taking a position that all our expositions of the scripture are without an error. So th this is the thing. You can have a prophet amongst you, but still have an error amongst you. And so these people that God is using, they are not the ends to the means. They are means to the end and not the end of it. And God allows them to lead the church to the point that he wants to lead them to. But they are not the end to the means. They are means to the end. And the end is Jesus Christ himself. In fact, the end is the Father himself. For we read in Philippians that uh, even the righteousness which we shall have is the righteousness of God, which is in Jesus Christ by faith. So the end of the means is God the Father himself. Because when everything will have been subdued, even the son shall be under the father. And why do I bring that point? Not to say that Christ is anything less of God, but we know that the great source of all is the father and he revealeth his secrets to his son who giveth to his child. But the point I want to make that um, human beings, with whatsoever gift they may be having, however prominent, and excellent that gift is, it is not the end of the means. It is the means to the end of the thing. And so we can have a prophetess. We can have a prophet among us, but there still be an error or the points of truth may not be as conclusive as they should be. The fact that certain doctrines have been held as truth for many years by our people is not a proof that our ideas are infallible. Age will not make error into truth, and truth can afford to be fair. No true doctrine will lose anything by close investigation. Council writers and editors, page 35, paragraph 2. And so in TM 105, paragraph 1, we read again, how shall we search the scriptures in order to understand what they teach? We should come to the investigation of God's word with a conrite heart, a teachable and prayerful spirit. We are not to think as did the Jews that our own ideas and opinions are infallible, nor with the purpose that certain individuals are the sole guardians of truth and knowledge, that men have no right to cite the scriptures for themselves, but must accept the explanations given by the fathers of the church. We should not study the Bible for the purpose of sustaining our preconceived opinions, but with the single object of learning what God has said. We are coming to a time, and this is for fellow Seventh-day Adventists, when we shall not stand with the writings of the pioneers and sister wife. But we ha shall have to stand in the courts and the councils of men and say, thus saith the word of God, which is infallible. Men can be, infall can be fallible even in their expressions. Listen, that the Bible, God used men, human beings, to express his thoughts. The inspiration was there, but the, even the articulation and giving of the word was uh, 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 the idea of the prophet trying to explain better what they understood God was communicating to them. That doesn't mean that the word they spoke was error, but they spoke as they understood. They were not given verbal inspiration per se, we shall be coming to verbal inspiration versus thought inspiration and distinguish what was inspired. Was it the person or was it the word? And so I know there's a contention on this, but we shall harmonize this. Every word of God is tested, we are told in the book of Psalm, and is proved down the goal of fear. And so we take that every word that was spoken by the prophet uh, canonical and non-canonical is the totality of what should be used. But even looking at the issue itself, 
the translation from Hebrew, the translation from Greek to the languages that we have is insufficient because there is an evolution of the language and words change as we go by. But then we understand that the inspiration doesn't change. The divine inspiration comes from the eternal spirit. And it is the same uh, both to canonical and non-canonical uh, uh, messengers of God. And so um, the issue is that uh, we may not come to a point we feel that what we have is the conclusiveness of the meaning of what these prophets were conveying. But um, God will continue revealing what he meant without contradicting what he gave these servants that ministered in Sandra times. And so uh, in TM 105 paragraph two, some have fear that if even single point they acknowledge themselves in error, other minds will be led to doubt the whole theory of truth. Therefore, they have felt that investigation should not be permitted, that it will tend to dissension and disunion. But if such is to be the result of investigation, the sooner it comes, the better. If there are those whose faith in God's word will not stand the test of the investigation of the scriptures, the sooner they are revealed, the better, for then the way will be open to show them their error. We cannot hold the position that position once taken, an idea once advocated, is not under any circumstances to be relinquished. There is one, there is but one who is infallible, he who is the way, the truth, and life. And uh, just to share an experience that um, is really a thorn in the independent ministries and self-supporting ministries. You find that um, brothers come together to investigate uh, a doctrine or a teaching. And uh, there is this tendency that uh, when the scriptures are investigated and the truth are examined, that if you do not speak verily the same words and in exact way that the other person is speaking, then you are in error or you are not in harmony. But there is no such a thing that the children of God will understand the text in the same way. There is nothing of that sort. And uh, there is nothing like one person can be inspired with all truth. That is why we even have various gifts in the church, which means that things can be uh, investigated from different standpoints and truth appreciated in different ways without speaking the same words. But while under the guiding principles of uh, the correct exegesis and uh, hermeneutics, we can appreciate the thoughts of one another. I, I, I like just to bring something uh, on the screen which um, will really amplify this thought. And uh, this issue that uh, we cannot see things the same way uh, this is uh, uh, different people views truth from different angles different people before that look at this the Lord moves upon ministers who have varied capabilities that they may feed the flock of his heritage with food convenient for them. They will reveal truth on points that their brother Le Lebera did not regard as essential. While the work of ministering to the flock are uh, left entailed to one man, there will be deficient in the result. In his providence, the Lord sends various workmen. One is strong on some essential point where another one is weak. Again, we must study the truth for ourselves. No living man should be relied upon to think for us. No matter who it is or in what position he may be placed, we are not to look upon any man as perfect criterion for us. We are to cancel, cancel together and to be subject to one another, but at the same time we are to exercise the ability God has given us to learn what is truth. Each one of us must look to God too for divine enlightenment. 
We must individually develop a character that will stand the test in the day of God. We must not become set in our ideas and think that no one should interfere with our opinions. Not revealed to just one or two. God has not passed his people by and chosen one solitary man here and one and another there as the only ones worth to be entrusted with his truth. He does not give one man new light contrary to the established faith of the body. In every reform, men have a reason making this claim. Paul warned the church in his day, of your own self shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples for after them. The greatest harm to God's people comes through those who go out from among them speaking perverse things. Through them, the way of truth is evil spoken. So no man, one man is entrusted with the whole truth. And then no one man, whether a teacher or a physician or a minister, can ever hope to be a complete whole. God has given to every man certain gifts and has ordained that men be associated in his service in order that the varied talents of man, many minds be blended. The conduct of mind with mind tends to quicken thought and increase the capabilities. The deficiencies of one laborer are often made up by the special gifts of another. And as physicians and teachers thus associated unite in imparting their knowledge, the youth under their training will receive a symmetrical, well-balanced education for service. And so you find that um, not one man is given the whole truth. Now, we see truths from different angles. And to say that one man angle is the, 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 the absolute truth is to enter into fanatical extremists uh, in that sense. And so let us look at this. One man may be conversant with the scriptures and some particular portion of the scripture may be especially appreciated by him. Another sees another portion as very important and thus one may present one point and another one another point and both may be of highest value. This is all in order of God. But if a man makes a mistake in his interpretation of some portion of the scripture, shall this cause diversity and disunion? God forbid. We cannot then take a position that the unity of the church consists in viewing every text of scripture in the very same light. The church may pass resolutions upon resolutions to put down all disagreement of opinions, but we cannot force the mind and will and thus to root out disagreement. These resolutions may conceal the discord, but they cannot quench it and establish the perfect agreement. Nothing can be can perfect unity in the church, but the spirit of Christ-like forbearance. Satan can now, can so discord Christ alone, can harmonize the disagreement, uh, disagreeing elements. Then let every soul sit down in Christ's school and learn of Christ who declares himself to be meek and lowly of heart. Christ says that if we learn of him, worries will cease and we shall find rest to our soul. So we cannot take that the unity of the church consists of everyone just viewing the scripture or the Bible text in the uh, same uh, way. And so another thing uh, is this, viewing truth from a different angle. If you differ your, with your brethren as to your understanding of the grace of Christ and the operation of his spirit, you should not make these differences prominent. You view the matter from one point, another just as devoted to God views the same question from another point and speaks of the things that make the deepest impression on his mind. Another viewing it from a still different point presents another face and how foolish it is to get into contention over these things when there is really nothing to contend about. Let God work on the mind and impress the heart. 1SM 183.1 Again, uh, when God is seen as he is, the blessed truth shines with a new and clearer light. That which kept the mind in perplexity is cleared away by the bright beams of the sun of righteousness. And yet, there are many things we shall not comprehend, but we have the blessed assurance that what we know not now, we shall know hereafter. Lastly, on this point of viewing truth from a different angle, we are one in faith in the fundamental truth of God's word and one 
object must be kept in view constantly that is harmony and cooperation must be maintained without compromising one principle of truth and while constantly digging for the truth as for hidden treasure be careful how you open a new and conflicting opinions we have a worldwide message the commandments of god and the testimonies of jesus christ are the burden of our work to have unity and love for one another is the great work now to be carried on there is danger of our ministers dwelling too much on doctrines, preaching altogether too many discourses on argumentative subjects when their own soul needs practical goalness. And so you will find that uh, different people view truth from different angles, and it will be foolish, as she says, to start contending that the very same words I speak, the same way I speak, the same way I do things is the way you should do things so as for us to see eye to eye. Truth should be appreciated from different angle. And if we are following after Christ, we shall know if it is his doctrine. Again, in TM 105.3, those who allow prejudice to bar the mind against the reception of truth cannot receive the divine enlightenment. Yet when a view of scripture is presented, Men, many do not ask, is it true in harmony with God's word, but by whom is it advocated? And unless it comes through the very channel that pleases them, they do not accept it. So thoroughly satisfied are they with their own ideas that they will not examine the scripture evident with a desire to learn, but refuse to be interested merely because of their prejudices. And so, and... Uh, it happens even among us who are calling ourselves reformers that once you hear something, you will hear people ask, have so and so believed in it? And what is the opinion of so and so? There is a lot of asking, is this person believing this? And has this person given out something? Instead of the people asking, what saith the word of God? People will never open their Bibles they will only open it to confirm their prejudices and they'll only open it to confirm what they believe and to twist the scriptures because their favorite ministers have said this and has said this. May God deliver us from these uh, boxes that we have put ourselves in with our favorite ministers. Again, in uh, 1844, she says, when anything came to our attention that we did not understand, we kneeled down and asked God to help us to take the right position. And then we were able to come to a right understanding and see eye to eye. There was no dissension, no enmity, no evil surmising, no misjudging of our brethren. If we but knew the evil of the spirit of intolerance, how careful would we shun it? And where did they find the truth? In uh, Advent Acts of Apostle, page 232, paragraph 1. But when unpopular Bible truth are presented, many refuse to make this investigation. Though unable to convert the plain teaching of Scripture, they yet manifest the utmost reluctance to study the evidence that is offered. Some assume that even if these doctrines are indeed true, it matters little whether or not they accept the new light and they cling to pleasing fables which the enemy uses to lead souls astray. Thus their minds are blinded by error and they become separated from heaven. And where do we investigate if it is not in the Bible? Let not those who have neglected to receive light and truth take advantage of the mistake of their brethren and put forth their finger and speak words of vanity because the chosen of God have been too ardent in their ideas and have carried certain matters in too strong a manner. We have need of these ardent elements for our work is not a passive work. Our work is aggressive. This is 1888, page 1888 materials, page 1244. And uh, I, I understand this is about uh, Wagona and Jonas. And so instead of asking who is uh, the advocate of this truth, we should be asking, does it tally with the word of God? And so uh, if... Uh, you differ with your brethren as to your understanding of the grace of Christ and operations of the Spirit. You should not make, not make this difference prominent, but um, we should come to the investigation uh, of the scriptures and see if these things are so. Uh, 
one thing that has been amongst us that uh, many of the workers are ready to hurl denunciations against the uh, other brethren who do not agree with them. And uh, this in a great way has hindered the giving of the spirit to the church because it was in the upper room when the disciples were, for, were confessing their weaknesses to each other and forgiving where they will forgive and trying to be a one unit for one purpose of uh, um, uh, progressing and spreading the great commission that the Lord was able to give his spirit. But where there is dissensions and the choosing of the favorite teachers, the choosing of favorite subjects, the shutting of ears to this and that, God cannot manifest himself. And brothers and sisters, let us think about this. The church is the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And it is in this body, not independent ministries, not self-supporting ministries, that we are given all gifts. And so if one brother who is having a gift from God will say, okay, I'm done with you. I'm going to form my own ministry. He runs away with one gift. Another one is given the gift and has some disagreement with another brother or a sister and say, I leave to you that church. He runs away with his gift. And we call it his gift, but it is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Another one takes the position, I'm done with this quarreling that is among us, these people. I'll just sit in the house. And because I'm gifted in writing and publishing, that is the whole work I'll do and nothing else. And so you continue quarreling wherever you are. And so you find that God wants to bring about a body as in Ephesians chapter 4, having all the gifts for the perfecting of the saints, for the ministry, for guiding into the full stature and the measure of the man Jesus, and for settling the church in truth, both spiritually and intellectually, so that it may not be tossed about with the winds of doctrine. And you find that the very people that he wants to make up the body, that they may be one flock, under one shepherd, one is running, running the other side and another one is running on the other opposite and the two which are standing together, they are giving each other their backs and kicking each other like donkeys and horses. They are like untrained horses. One plunges forward and another plunges backward. And then we can say, you know what? All of us that have run into different directions, we are the body of Christ, even the invisible body of Christ. Now, if you can relate as a family, a visible family, who told you that you can relate as a, an invisible family? And so the issue is this. When there are converted matters, the people should come together in the spirit of Christ and not look at their favorite speakers, favorite preachers, but they should investigate what saith the word of God. And so lay aside these people that you are looking unto their arms of flesh and cast is a man who leans on the arm of flesh. We are looking at the lesser light versus the greater light. And there are people whom God have used, non-canonical. Now we are talking about non-canonical uh, messengers of God. And people have taken these non-canonical messengers and made them everything instead of going back to the Bible and making the Bible everything and leaning on the inspiration of the Spirit to be able to establish their faith. And so uh, in uh, when the Advent movement was still in its inception, in its beginning, there were variances that were there on the understanding of certain doctrine and certain matters. But how did these people deal with them actually? How did these people deal with uh, these um, differences they had? In TM 25.3, Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 
Sometimes one or two of the brethren will stubbornly set themselves against the view presented. and would act out the natural feeling of the heart. But when this disposition appeared, we suspended our investigations and adjourned our meeting that each one might have an opportunity to go to God in prayer and without conversation with others, study the point of difference, asking light from heaven. With expression of friendliness, we parted to meet again soon as possible for further investigation. At times, the power of God came upon us in a marked manner and when clear light revealed the points of truth we will weep and rejoice together we loved jesus but also we loved one another in wesley's time as in all ages of the church history men of different gifts perform their appointed work they did not harmonize upon every point of doctrine but all were moved by the spirit of god and united in absorbing aim to win souls to christ the differences between Whitefield and Wesley threatened at one time to create alienation, but as they learned meekness in the school of Christ, mutual forbearance and charity reconciled them. They had no this time to dispute, while error and iniquity were teeming everywhere and sinners were going down. And so think think also for the think about this also for one moment. During the time of Reformation, these people did not really harmonize in all points of doctrine. But this did not cause them to separate from each other. In fact, you will find that uh, the messengers which God has sent us, the lesser lights, the personage themselves, that God has entrusted with this light. Uh, many of the time you'll find that at the beginning, they will not have a problem. But as they start having congregation, they develop or the people develop um, a spirit of my favorite speaker. And then there is something they see in another messenger and they don't like it. And then they take a position. And then so we develop the group of this and this and the group of so and so. And so in the beginning, the messengers did not have a problem. But as they continued having uh, people listen to them and ministering to various people, it is the people that took the position of putting these messengers at variance. And because these are human beings, these lesser lights are human beings. And because at some time pride gets over them, they... Uh, become uh, antagonistic to each other, not because they wanted to be antagonistic to each other, but it is the spirit of those who have chosen them to be their leaders or have relied on them uh, and leaned on them, uh, leaned on them as the arm of flesh that have brought in them another spirit, which was not the spirit that God had given them when he gave them the message for the people. And so, the people should be careful how they exalt these lesser lights, the messengers that the Lord has given the light and is directing the people. The teachers among us, the preachers and the evangelists, the elders and the pastors, we should never put them in the place where we shall instill the, in them a spirit of variance in that uh, we start uh, banging our heads and um, again, differing on the things that we shouldn't differ. We should make the main point the main point and uh, stop measuring in uh, that which is uh, not major. And so as we bring this to a close, we shall be attacked on every point. We shall be tried to the utmost. We do not want to hold our faith simply because it was handed down to us by our fathers. Such a faith will not stand the terrible test that is before us. We want to know why we are Seventh-day Adventists, what real reason we have for coming out from the world as a separate and distinct people. And uh, how do we come to that position? By understanding the scriptures for ourselves and being able to defend the scriptures for ourselves and not saying so and so said it. We shall be very disappointed in the end time if uh, our main work has been to quoting this and to quoting that 
without having a Bible knowledge uh, for uh, ourselves. Our minds must be then prepared for the great test, not only to resist temptation, but um, what we find in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Peter 3, 15. Uh, where we are told that, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with the meekness and uh, meekness and fear. It doesn't tell us that sanctify such a man and such a woman in our heart. It tells us sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready to answer from the scriptures the hope that you have in you with meekness and fear. We are in danger as a people to be departing from God and uh, uh, relying on the interpretations of men. While the vessel has been inspired, but the vessel is not the end to the means, but the means to the end. And so, in Council to Writers and Editors, page 39, paragraph 1, I have a couple of pages to finish this. We read this. The fact that there is no controversy or agitation among God's people should not be regarded as conclusive evidence they are, that they are, are holding fast to sound doctrine. There is a reason to fear that they may not be clearly discriminating between truth and error. When no new questions are started by investigation of the scriptures, not investigation of so and so. When no difference of opinion arises which will set men to searching the Bible for themselves, to make sure that they have the truth, there will be many now, as in ancient time, who will hold to tradition and worship they know not what. I have been shown that many who profess to have a knowledge of present truth know not what they believe. They do not understand the evidences of their faith. They have no just appreciation of the work of the, for the present time. When the time of trial shall come and there are men now preaching to others who will find upon examining the positions they hold that there are many things for which they can give no satisfactory reason. Until thus tested, they knew not their great ignorance. And there are many in the church who take it for granted that they understand what they believe. But until controversy arises, they do not know their own weakness. When separated from those of like faith and complement and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, they will be surprised to see how confused are their ideas of what they had accepted as truth. Certain it is that there has been among us a departure from the living God and turning to men, putting human wisdom in place of divine. And then she says that uh, in 4B uh, SG, I saw that the people of God must put on the armor and arouse. Christ is coming and the great work of the last message of mercy is too much important for us to leave it and come down to under such a falsehood and misrepresentation. Uh, as uh, the one of the messengers part. And uh, you know, the reason why people are going to have the problem, we are told that uh, we have been following after men and in a great and a large extent, we have uh, been reflectors of uh, other people's ideas. This is the greatest problem that we are having right now. And uh, unless we come out of this, that God has given us the prophets and the teachers as lesser lights to guide us to the greater light, which is Jesus Christ. If we make these people the greater light, the people themselves, not what they are saying, the people themselves, so that everything that cometh from their mouth shall be deemed as truth because they are our favorite speakers. Then, for sure, when the test comes upon us and we are to stand and defend our faith, our ideas will be confused as never before. And so, lastly, what is the problem 
that we are having in Great Controversy 164.1. Great Controversy 164.1, the last thing that we are reading, uh, 164.1. This is the greatest problem we are having. Yet Charles had deliberately rejected the truth presented by Luther. I am firmly resolved to imitate the example of my ancestors, wrote the monarch in D. Abgen, book seven, chapter nine. He had decided that he will not step out of the path of custom even to walk in the ways of truth and righteousness. Because his fathers did, he would uphold the papacy. With all it is cruelty and corruption, thus he took his position, refusing to accept any light in advance of what his fathers had received or to perform any duty that they had not performed. There are many, this is what I want to read. There are many at the present day thus clinging to the custom and tradition of their fathers as this person, Charles, was doing. When the Lord sends them additional light, they refuse to accept it because not having been granted to their fathers, it was not received by them. We are not placed where our fathers were. Consequently, our duties and responsibilities are not the same as theirs. We shall not be approved of God in looking to the example of our fathers to determine our duty instead of searching the word of truth for ourselves. Our responsibility is greater than was that of our ancestors. We are accountable for the light which they received and which was handed down as an inheritance for us. And we are accountable also for the additional light which is now shining upon us from the word of uh, God. And so the biggest problem that we are having right now is that uh, once we take these people that are called the lesser lights and put them in the position of the greater light, we cannot advance in any way in our reforms and in our understanding of the light. And so God has non-canonical messengers he has sent among us. They may be prophets, they may be teachers, they may be medical missionaries, they may be whatever thing that you would like, including Sister E.G. White. But if we place her where God should be placed, then we cannot go further. And she said, when we do that, then she says, God only is infallible, but human beings are fallible. And we cannot take position that the, everything we have believed is the entirety of the truth. And we cannot say that God will not add additional light. That we say, okay, Adventism had it is pioneers, it had a prophetess amongst them or a messenger, and we cannot believe anything else or we cannot advance in light, but just remain where, where they are. Brothers and sisters, this is a dangerous position. And unless we put the messengers rightly where they should be and put God where rightly he should be because he is the only one infallible, error may be hoary in age, but it's not true. And so the sooner we go back to the scripture and investigate them for the truth, the better we will be prepared for the end time crisis. And uh, you know, the people outside there are preparing for the Sunday law. We do not know how much they are preparing for that. You may just think it is certain performing miracles and all that stuff. People are preparing when we are brought before the councils to defend what they believe and they are doing every such they, they can. They are doing everything in their power to educate their people in reasoning and how to twist even the scriptures. And so if we are not diligently searching the scriptures and being conversant with what it says and what it rightly says, certain is that when we are brought before these people who have human wisdom and intellectual philosophy, and one thing that if we will not be having a relationship with Jesus Christ, we shall find ourselves confused. And so the lesser light versus the greater light. These messengers or these inspired non-canonical writers are to guide us back to God. And Sister White says that the Lord and God of heaven will have a people on the earth who will maintain the Bible and Bible alone. For perilous are the times before us when we will need no other anchor but what we have been given in the Holy Scriptures. 
Not that he says that he what she's presenting is false. No, that is not the issue. The issue is this. If we follow after the Christ, after if we follow after Christ, we shall know of his doctrine. And no one who has ever followed Christ has been at variance with his word. And so may the Lord bless us as we continue in this series of the prophets. And may you continue learning how even to be able to test the prophet, receive and reject those who will be sent or who will not be sent. And a most important thing, that as we study these scriptures, we are partaking of the blood and the flesh of Jesus Christ. And then we shall be nourished spiritually just as we partake of uh, the, uh, the natural food and we are replenished physically. So partaking of the word of God will replenish us spiritually. And then God has promised in the book of Matthew chapter 10, when we are brought before the council, he shall bring into remembrance. Let us not even think a full time what we shall speak because he has led us in the past and we have known the truth and we have had a relationship with him. He will bring the tongue of wisdom that none will be able to gain say it for it will not be us speaking but the spirit of God in us. The same spirit that authored the scriptures, the same spirit that gives the gift to the messengers is the same gift that will work in us if we happen to live at that time of crisis, crisis and may the Lord bless us with um, those remarks. Shall we pray? Our dear Father in heaven, thank you again that uh, you would like to reveal your will unto us. And uh, you have been so great to give your church the gifts of the Holy Spirit to guide them until the end of the age. We want to share in these gifts and uh, from different standpoints, we want to be of benefit to each other. Rather than drawing aside, help us to have this unity and appreciate just what you have sent each member of uh, the body to do. And so thank you for these sessions and thank you for the instruments that you are using through us agencies to pass these messages. Bless us, Lord, and help us to be able to stand in truth. And after standing, we still be standing, that we may be sealed in this truth, never to be tossed here and there by the winds of doctrine. Bless your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so in number five, we shall be looking at uh, the Bible, verse E.G. White, and trying to look into the quotes, some of the quotes we have read deeply, and see what the Lord is speaking unto us. Until then, Godspeed, and bye for now.